We are live. So welcome everyone to APH annual meeting. We are so glad to have you with us today. You are starting us off right. We are glad you are with us. This is How to Be Better Together, AER, DBIDB. You can place your questions in the chat. If you are also collecting your ACB REP credits for attendance, your opening code word is standards. Hold on to that and then wait for that closing code word. You can submit them with the link I'm placing in the chat or you can submit them in the crowd compass. The link is also under certificate of attendance so that you can submit that as well. Welcome, welcome, we'll let everybody roll in. One more time, your opening code word today is standards. And I am going to turn it over to Nicole. Nicole, it's all yours. Hi everyone, I'm Nicole Johnson and I am current president of CEC Division on Visual Impairment and Deaf Blindness. And I'm also a professor at Clipstown University in Pennsylvania for preparing future teachers of the blind at an undergraduate and graduate level. I am very, very excited to be here today and we are going to be focusing on how to be better together. So my co-presenter is Mark Reichert from AER. Hey, Nicole. Thanks, everybody. So fun to be part of this exercise. And I will out our friend Leanne here for a second with APH, who said, you guys are going to be kind of my guinea pigs for today. So uh, I, I, it's always fun to be part of an experiment. But it is, it's, uh, it's a joy to be with all of you. And Nicole, it's fun to be able to partner with you on this. It's just a really awesome idea. So we're going to start um, throughout the panels and as we're talking please post questions in the chat that you have because we're going to go back and answer them as we have time for questions and feel free to stop and take a break on your own whenever you need to because we know two hours is a long time and we didn't have a formal scheduled break so please feel free to get up if you need to stretch your legs at any time and please we want this whole session to be interactive so please interact in the chat um, Leanne is going to post a poll because we would like to know who is a member of AER or CEC, DVIDB, or both. Um, so if you can please um, answer in the poll because we just want an idea of who is with us today and what your organization affiliation is, if any. So, so I, see the poll yeah, I was going to say, I'm going to give the choices. Your choice, if you can't access the poll, you can write it in the chat. You can type AER. CEC DVIDB, oops, sorry, typo there, both or neither. So if you can't access the chat, the um, poll, you're welcome to type it in the chat. Both work. And wait one more minute because numbers are still coming in. Okay, just about everybody has selected. So I'm going to end the poll and I'm going to share those results. 39% AER, zero just CEC, 14% both, 47% neither. So we're hoping that our session can really explain how professional organizations can help professionals and how we can work together to help the whole field and all of you. So hopefully um, those of you that are neither um, you might change your mind, <laughs> but I wanted to start with what's new with DVIDB as president, and I'm going to show the website in a second, but some things that are coming up that are important is March 3rd of 2021, we're having a pre-conference. So the CEC International Conference went full virtual, and that registration information is coming out, and that is going to be the second week of March. But the week before that, on March 3rd, we're going to have an all-day Zoom virtual pre-conference, and we're going to offer ACVREP hours, and we're going to be featuring Dr. Penny Rosenblum with Finding Wheels for half the day. 
And the second part of the day will be Monique Coleman, and she's going to talk about cultural responsiveness in our field. Mm -hmm. And then Linda Hogwood on meaningful literacy for students with additional disabilities and visual impairments. So people can register for part of the day, the whole day for ACVREP mm -hmm. credits, but we would love you to join us. You don't have to be a member mm -hmm. um, to attend. And we'd like to see you if that would interest you. DBIDB has been offering a lot of webinars and I will show you where they're at. And more recently, we've been pairing with our partner AER on various webinars and activities. Our next one coming up is with many people. So we are from the Helen Kellen um, National Center and it's going to be the Helen Kellen National Center and the viability of virtual O&M services for adults who are deaf blind. So that is on November 18th and that is sponsored by DVIDB, AER, Allied, OMSA, APH and there's several. So we encourage you to join that for O&M. DBIDB has been in the process of updating the standards. So our teacher of the blind and visually impaired standards were updated last year um, and posted on our website. And right now, Dr. Amy Parker and Adam Graves from Texas School for the Blind are spearheading the deafblind standards. So they are being completely updated. The process has been very inclusive and we definitely want to hear from you if you have thoughts. And Amy, Dr. Parker is going to share more about that later. We also had a joint presidential award with DVI, DVI DVIDB, and um, AER. Sorry, I'm going to share my screen to show the presidential award. And we wanted to honor someone or people that went above and beyond um, during COVID-19 for our field. So um, Emily Coleman, the president of AER, and I kind of went through our field and said who really stood out and went above and beyond. And we awarded three different presidential awards and joint between AER and CEC. And they were awarded mm -hmm. Dr. Um, Penny Rosenblum. And that was for bringing everyone together um, for the study on flattening and inaccessibility um, due to COVID-19 and how it's mm -hmm. impacting the lives of adults in the United States. And she's going to talk about that a little bit later. We also awarded one to Virtual Excel Academy, which was spearheaded by Dr. Cheryl Hannon um, from California State, Leanne Grillet from Outreach Services at APH, and Charlotte Cushman from Pass to Literacy. And they offered over 50 different lessons available to everyone on the expanded mm -hmm. core curriculum. And the daily lessons really supplemented learning. So many students, over 2,000 people registered for these sessions from around the world. We also ordered one to TSBVI Coffee Hour, and they allowed it teachers and professionals, paraprofessionals to sign on for free and ask questions, get information. And they also had thousands participate. So these were the three that um, DVIDB and AER joined and we awarded. So we were really excited because although COVID-19 has been a really hard time. There's been a lot of good things going on in our field and people working together to really support our students and who are blind and adults. But on our website, um, we always have our quarterly issue, which is a very practitioner friendly journal. If you ever wanted to read, it's online, it's free. Um, and we update, we usually have four a year and our professional standards. So if you're interested in seeing what teachers of the blind and visually impaired are learning, um, what professionals in deaf blindness are learning, I again, encourage you to go there and check that out as well. All of our webinars are posted on here and you can register on here for our different webinars. We've had a lot. Um, one we had, which was based around home and is available for you to watch for free, which was also a joint webinar is home is a powerful place for learning and this is available to you and it was from people with children who have visual impairment deaf blindness and their perspective and it was very good it's 90 minutes and we held that joint with AR BVI and finally if you are a member of CEC DVI DB we our elections are up so we need new members of our board so please make your voice heard in that go back. 
And if anyone has questions about CEC, please feel free to reach out to myself or anyone on the board. And I'm going to turn it over to Mark to And while say you're doing that, hold on. You do have one question. Did Penny's report come out in August? Um, Penny will be talking about that in about a half hour. So okay. if she does not answer your question, we can certainly go back to that. So I'm going to allow Mark Riker to talk about what's new with AER. Thanks, Nicole. I appreciate it. And, and I, can I just say I love the strategy of keeping people in suspense with their questions. Good for you. <laughs> stay, stay on the edge of your seat uh, for the entire two and a half hours of this presentation. So um, thanks so much. My name is Mark Reichert. I currently serve as the interim executive director for AER. I, I don't know what it is in our field, um, but we love names of organizations that are extremely long. In our case, AER stands for the Association for Education and Rehabilitation of the Blind and Visually Impaired. Now you know why we call it AER, as my friend and colleague and AER past president Billy Berkshire used to say. Um, from that name, what you should deduce is that we're trying to be as inclusive as we possibly can. Indeed, for our uh, long history, 30 plus, oh gosh, 36, coming up at 37, I guess, uh, plus years of existence. And quite candidly, uh, for the almost 100 years before that, when AER was comprised of two other sort of uh, constituent organizations, uh, the purpose of AER is really to bring professionals from all of the various professional disciplines in our community uh, together, uh, from teachers to folk on the rehab side of things, to uh, adult services across the board, indeed from the, in the aging sector, but also as our field has evolved uh, to um, make sure that we're focusing on folks who provide uh, technology related services, indeed areas that maybe um, have not had anywhere near the focus that they should like psychosocial issues or leadership uh, and growing uh, folks in our field to be leaders. So AER, uh, for the uh, few of you who may not know this, uh, we're uh, certainly we work at the international level for sure. I get the pleasure of partnering with a 17 member board of elected leaders and I'm so proud and uh, excited that my colleague, friend and AER boss and uh, uh, board president Neva Fairchild is with us today and she'll be featured on a later panel. Uh, but in addition to that work, AER's uh, you know, frontline folk for whom we exist are each and every individual member uh, of our organization who at the state and local level participates in state chapters, uh, state chapter structures of AER. And um, I, in one of the things that we'll probably be discussing over the course of time, especially on our upcoming panel about who we all are and what we do and how we can work better together is not so much on how AER can do better working with our chapters that we know we for sure need to do that, uh, but how we can all sort of bring the field together and communicate as a field, as a community more effectively. We also have an array of about 15 or so, 16, I can't remember the number off the top of my middle aged head, uh, but at least a dozen and a half of special interest divisions uh, representing specific professional disciplines or um, domains with which, uh, in which people uh, who serve folks of blind, visually impaired of all ages work and serve and, and the rest. So what you should conclude from all of that is that if you are on a, uh, at a meeting like this, there is absolutely no reason why you couldn't and shouldn't uh, be a part of AER. Indeed, I think uh, both Nicole and I um, will unabashedly be saying throughout today's presentation that uh, we want you, as the poster goes. Uh, but there's most, without exaggeration, um, AER for sure has a place for you and, and, and we need you. Uh, I uh, am not a professional in the blindness of vision impairment. I don't have a background, for example, in orientation and mobility. I'm not a teacher of students with vision impairments. Uh, go down the list. I've just had the distinct privilege to have been blessed to be served by people who work in those professions. And I'm sorry, I'm getting a little emotional. Uh, but I can tell you that um, every day of my life, I, I don't miss thinking about my orientation and mobility instructor, um, my TBI, um, and I use those skills every day. Um, I, 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 and, and so if you're in the work uh, in, in the world of work with folks who are blind and visually impaired, first of all, God bless you. And secondly, thanks for joining us today. 
So I'll just mention three uh, specific areas uh, that I know of particular uh, keen interest to those of us in the AER world uh, these days. And then, uh, and then I'll be quiet and we'll move to our next panel um, because I know that uh, we're gonna get into a bit more detail about what all of us are up to. So I'll just flag three things. Uh, it is no secret uh, that AER is going through all kinds of transitions these days. Uh, yours truly currently holds and proudly holds the title of interim executive director. That's just one what aspect of the transitions that AER is going through. But what we've decided to do is, in AER is to make sure that we are in the broadest possible sense reaching out to our community, to each and every one of you, but not if I can put it this way, not only to folks who could be AER or CEC members or who are currently in that in those categories, but frankly, everyone and anyone uh, who has an interest in blindness and vision impairment, making sure that consumers are better provi uh, provided quality service, making sure that uh, bottom line is if you have at all an interest, you're a parent, you're a consumer, come on in. Uh, we want, especially those of you who are longtime observers of uh, this field and how we do what we do, uh, we want to hear from you. And so while there are going to be a number of ways in which uh, AER is proud to sort of make that happen, and, and, and my parenthetical right here is thanks to uh, our friends at the American Printing House for the Blind for having both uh, Nicole and I, DEI, DDI, DB, and AER, have a forum like this because indeed this I mean, you're, you're sitting in one of those uh, opportunities right now and uh, so this fits so nicely with what we're wanting to do but over the course of this fall we're, we're putting together three opportunities that we're sort of hopefully in a very friendly way styling our autumn community reunions um, you know we kind of wrestled around with different names for this thing we sort of settled on community reunions because it frankly sounds friendly and family oriented. And indeed, I think our community uh, is really blessed by the fact that so many of us have known each other for a long time. The flip side of that is that if you get a nickname in this field, you're gonna be stuck with it for 30 years uh, and that's fine. Um, but, uh, and no, you don't need to point out what mine is. Uh, but I would say to you that over the course of this next few months, uh, all are invited to attend these events they're going to happen on October 22nd, November 10th, and November 30th. Um, if you haven't seen emails about that, I'm sure you will. And I know we're going to be uh, sharing some contact info, et cetera, here. So hopefully we'll, uh, if you haven't, if you don't know what I'm talking about, uh, you will shortly. But at least two of those events, we're going to be inviting you to uh, weigh in with your thoughts. We're kind of, as Neva has sort of helped us style it, one of the aspects of these community reunion events is going to be sort of a think tank activity where we're thinking in very much broad terms about the strategic direction, for sure, not just of AER, but our field and frankly, how AER can help make that happen. So we're doing that along with some uh, continuing end opportunities that'll be part of that event so that we incentivize as much participation as possible. And then finally, uh, on the October 22nd and November 10th evenings, but especially on November 30th, we are going to be celebrating our 2020 AER award recipients, and in particular on November 30th. And uh, a shameless plug, and I, look, I, I am excited about November 30th. I, I would love to, I've been very frank with folks, I'd love to see this become a regular part of our community's uh, time to come together, and especially right after that Thanksgiving holiday, an amazing time to, you know, it's not about AER per se, but it's about lifting up our colleagues and friends who've contributed so much. Uh, to our field, to recognize them, uh, and uh, and to frankly give thanks for each other. So uh, be watching for those activities. If you don't know, you'll you get about it. Yet you're you know it now, and you're going to start to see some email coming soon. Uh, what you should take away from that is that there's a lot of stuff that we all should be doing uh, together. Issues we need to consider, things maybe that we need to do a little bit differently, and maybe we all ought to be assuming different positions and roles and tactics that. Uh, Maybe we've done a little bit of in the past, but maybe we need to revisit. Uh, you for sure are welcome to participate in those activities, but I can tell you, and this is my second of the three points, uh, is that one of the things that AER is doing now a bit more aggressively uh, is a, a concerted continuing education professional development activity. Um, 
hardly a new thing. I mean, Lord knows AER has been in the continuing ed business for a good long while through our biennial international conferences, for sure, and other things. We've put on a lot of events, even, indeed even virtual events over the course of time. Uh, but I think like all of us, we've recognized that these wild and crazy days have forced us into getting a lot more comfortable with technology and approaches that we haven't in the past. Uh, at least embraced as, as, as warmly as, as maybe we should have. So one of the things that AER has to do is to, uh, you know, we, 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 we need a little bit of a uh, juicing up, uh, if you will, on our own sort of internal processes and methods and technologies. So we hope to be uh, announcing fairly soon sort of our own uh, re-energized uh, uh, infrastructure for delivering continuing ed con uh, content our focus has been on doing that for AER members. And right now, if you're an AER member, you can take advantage of what, uh, frankly, by the end of this year, will be almost uh, about 100 clock hours worth of continuing ad credit, which I think is fabulous. Uh, uh, and uh, what will the future of that look like? I mean, if you're not an AER member, can you take part in it? Um, stay tuned, uh, because uh, we're certainly gonna wanna make sure that people can take advantage of the content that we have to offer there and the expertise that's available and all of that professional development uh, material. Uh, but our focus most assuredly uh, has, has been on um, promoting AER membership and, uh, and, and serving our members. So if you are an AER member, God, lo God love you. And hopefully you've been enjoying the, um, hopefully you'll be enjoying these uh, sessions and we'll see, I'm sorry, I'm having a little bit of trouble because I'm, I guess I'm going to have to turn off speech here because I keep, every time there's a message sent, it's distracting me. Hold on just a Sorry minute. about that, Mark. <laughs> that was me. I, I just figured you were sending me love notes. Either that or you were trying to tell me to shut up. I am almost done. But um, so uh, bottom line is be watching for that. Uh, it, we've been so excited uh, about the, the turnout and uh, it just amazes me every time we do one of these one hour sessions on what I think are interesting topics, but you say, my goodness, where uh, are people going to turn out for this? And you have 50, 60, 70 people consistently turning out for these one hour sessions. That's wonderful. So be watching for that. My final point and very much related to it is uh, we hope to be doing a lot more to fill out or uh, flesh out uh, our new <laughs> system as it, as it emerges. And uh, the only way we can do that is by partnering with each and every one of you and by partnering with our brother and sister organizations like the American Printing House for the Blind. And uh, Leanne, I know I'm not telling tales out of school, but we've got a lot more to share about this at some point here in the near future. But AER and APH are gonna be partnering to do at least about a, a dozen part series that lifts up uh, APH's products uh, how to use them and have some really good clear learning objectives as we um, help folks get even more acquainted than they perhaps already are with what APH has to offer. And those will all be for continuing ed credit uh, as well. So as I say, as we get to the end of this calendar year, we're gonna have probably over a hundred hours of, of, these, of this material and it's only gonna grow and grow. You might say, great, glad, glad that's happening and can't wait to see that. But Mark, how do I participate? Uh, in these activities. How do I, you know, I've got a session or two I'd love to do, but we'd love to hear from you. So you can either reach out to yours truly at mark at aerbvi.org um, or to our colleague, Megan Doty. Megan is our e-learning and professional development guru and manager, program manager, who's fabulous. Some of you have gotten to know her as she has been facilitating these sessions. I think you know, if she were here, she would say all of us at AER, including your interim executive director, are learning an awful lot about how to pull all of this together. So we too are kind of our own guinea pigs as we move through this process. So I would ask that A, you be patient with us and B, be as excited as we are because I think, you know, all of us were pretty um, disappointed that because of COVID and everything else that we had to, um, put aside for this summer, this past July, our biennial international conference. And that was not an easy decision to make. It's also not an easy decision to make when you're looking at an organization's budget, um, for sure. And so not only are we looking for strategies to uh, make sure that AER is fisc fiscally healthy, and I think it is, given the hard choices we've had to make, but we also need to find, an, I don't wanna say an alternative, but a supplement to um, that in-conference experience, because I don't think any of us know yet. Uh, what the implications are to all of this. With that, I know we'll have more to say over the course of time. 
Oh, I'm sorry. I, I meant to, if you want to reach out about uh, helping us with sessions that you're interested in putting on, reach out to Megan at AERBVI.org. And that's Megan without an H. So M-E-G-A-N. And if, uh, if you were able to get if you were able to get into this session, then you are sophisticated enough to probably do your own uh, session recording, and that's fantastic. If you're one of those people, though, uh, who needs multiple cups of coffee in order to log into a session like this, or you say, gee, I just don't know how this technology works, don't worry about it. That's why we're here at AER to help you pull it off. If you have an idea to do a session, we want to hear from you, um, and, uh, and we'll help you pull it off. My last comment would be that we, um, uh, our, our, and, and perhaps Nini will say more about this when the time comes, but we're so pleased to work, you know, in AER, our, it's a membership-driven organization, and our colleague and friend Kay Ratzlaff has been serving as our AER Continuing Education Committee Chair, and uh, I'm sure she'd love to hear from uh, any of you about your ideas. We're not doing all this in a vacuum. Uh, a AER and Kay Ratzlaff and her powerful committee are helping all of us navigate through not only the logistics of this, but also um, the policies that are going to be governing uh, how we do what we do. I'm in no position, not being a professional in this field, I'm not going to make judgments about the quality of these sessions. Uh, your peers and colleagues will. So with that, um, Nicole, uh, thanks so much. And I'll just say to you, Nicole, it's such a pleasure to be able to partner with you. I was a little jealous uh, of, of, uh, of, of you and Emily putting those awards together. And I'm glad we did that. But I'm so pleased that we now um, have this opportunity today. But over back to you. So our first panel is going to be on working together to improve your professional organization. So how can we all work together and make our organizations better to serve the community of visual impairment and blindness? So I already introduced myself, so I'm going to let my other two panelists introduce themselves and I will start with Donna McNear. Thank you, Nicole, and, um, and thank you, Mark. Uh, it was fascinating getting an update on my organizations, my professional organizations, so thank you for that. Um, I appreciate all, all the work you're doing, and, and I want to say thank you to all the attendees for uh, joining us uh, around professional organizations. For me, it's fundamental to my career. And so I live in Minnesota, rural Minnesota, and I'm a, uh, as it says, a teacher, researcher, and organizational leader. And um, I work, my cocktail chatter uh, description of what I do is I, uh, as a consultant, I uh, work with anybody who's doing good things for kids who are blind and visually impaired and help them do it better. All right, thank you, Donna. And I will let um, Dr. John McAllister introduce himself as well. Oh, we can't hear you, John. I think you're muted. I had to mute you. You were giving feedback at one time, so you'll have to hit the unmute button. There you go. Uh, what about now? Oh, you're good good morning. Um, I would like to say thank you to all the attendees and thank you all for inviting me here this morning. My name is John McAllister. I'm a professor, a professor here at the University of Arkansas Little Rock and the Rehab of the Blind Orientation and Mobility Program. I also am the commissioner for the Higher Education Accreditation Committee. Um, and of course, you know, we are um, responsible for the accreditation, uh, AER AE accreditation for programs who um, um, uh, educate professionals in the field of blindness and visually impaired. Thank really you. appreciate John. Really appreciate you joining us, uh, uh, folks out there. Yours truly, Mark Reichert here, will be your friendly neighborhood moderator for this lovely panel. Which means uh, you'll be delighted to know that I have the least work to do on this uh, panel, and we're going to hear from these uh, longtime uh, leaders in our field. And uh, my job for right now is to pitch a nice softball question to these folks. And my softball question is this. Um, why are you involved in your professional association? Couldn't be an easier question. Why is it so important to you? And whoever wants to go. I'll call on you if you're going to be shy. Oh, there you go. Um, 
this is Nicole and I'll answer first because my answer is probably different um, than both Donna and John's. But I got involved um, once I received my, or was receiving my doctorate degree. I really just wanted to make connections in the field because I am a program of one at Kutztown University. So I teach all the courses and I wanted to really reach out and ask for help and see what's going on in the field, stay current because I was not teaching you know, K to 12 anymore. So the first I fell into CEC DBIDB um, and they really took me in and I got on the board and I made a lot of colleagues and now friends that I was able to reach out and really grow as a professional and get into research and really find out what evidence-based practices are going on and give them to my students so they can use with their students. And then from CEC, that kind of went and they're like, oh, well, you have to join AER2 and go to AER International. So I started getting involved in that. And it really just helped me learn and grow as a teacher, as a professor, and just as a professional in the field. And I don't think I would be at where I'm at um, if I didn't have that support of my colleagues because I felt isolated as a program of one. Excellent. Donna, how about you? I know you've been active in, in both groups, so love to hear your thoughts on why why one and not two or, why, or whatever. Why, why two and why not two. one? Why two and not one? Thanks, That's Mark. Uh, you know, I was listening to Nicole and, Oak, and Nicole talked about why she joined initially. And um, my joining the organizations initially was about 30 years ago. So I was a member of AER, I think in the late 80s and then um, uh, CEC DVIDB, um, early, maybe like 1991. And then, um, so the question also is why do I sustain the membership, right, for over 30 years? So when I first joined as a beginning teacher, um, it, it was for a lot of the reasons Nicole um, shared, um, and I wanna emphasize um, high standards, um, as a teacher, I wanted to um, really be effective and do well. And like Nicole said, she's um, in a program of one at Kutztown. Well, living in rural Minnesota and serving school districts as a beginning teacher, I was isolated as the only teacher, you know, in a, a 50 mile radius. And so I, I felt I needed to be connected. So, um, and as an orientation and mobility specialist or also, um, AER was my go-to organization initially. And then um, when I became in a leadership uh, position for uh, teachers in Minnesota, what was so awesome at the time is they gave me a membership in CEC. And that's where I learned the value of uh, being part of an organization that also had the bigger uh, world of special education behind it. And so as, as the years went on, I um, continued to mm -hmm. highly value um, the, the membership in both organizations. And you know, have I ever been lax on my renewing my membership? <laughs> yes, but I've always renewed it. And I've always gone to both conferences. Um, I don't think I've ever missed an AER conference. Wow, well, good for you. And um, uh, for CEC conferences, I, I think I've been to 25 of them. Um, wow. Um, I, do, I, I don't know how to count that high, but anyway. <laughs> So, um, I mean, I could go on and on, Mark, about um, the value, especially as a teacher. Um, you know, for example, the, the journals, you know, going and getting good information um, about research is incredibly important to me. The conferences, um, the networking with people, meeting people, the sorting through issues, the <laughs> critical professional dialogue, the critical thinking that goes along with it. Um, and they establish our context for professionalism. And uh, that's really, was always really important to me as a teacher, having the confidence in making decisions around children that was well informed by what was going on uh, and staying current. 
And, and so after all these years, I, I, I feel I've stayed current because of um, all the things that you're doing in leadership roles with our professional organizations and for myself staying engaged. And um, I really feel that being a member of professional organizations helps me be a uh, more reflective, a deeper thinker. And I think my, my students and the people I'm in, involved with benefit from that um, constant reflection and deep thinking. And um, the other thing I've learned a lot about advocacy and, um, and also understanding policy to practice. The importance yeah. of, as a teacher, understanding policy and, and how that flips into practice for me as a um, frontline person. So, um, and then I'm gonna just say a few more things and uh, uh, listen. Um, I think our organizations for me as a teacher, because it's hard, so it supports a sense of vision and purpose. And um, it reinvigorates me, it encourages me. Um, there's renewal and inspiration and, and we celebrate our profession. So I could write an essay, but I'm gonna stop there. <laughs> and John, before we turn over to you, I just wanna say Donna, uh, uh, in preparation for this call, uh, it, you really said something that uh, when we were all kind of gathering separately that really touched me. And uh, we, we could write a, a, a huge biography for you in terms of settling on your title and the things that you've done over the years, the various roles. And you, you said to us, you know, but for sure, let's make sure that we put front and center that I'm a teacher. And there's just hearing that sense in your voice about how important that is to you that fundamentally being known as that teacher of students um, that's beautiful. And I think uh, if, if any of our, if either of our groups stand for anything, it's making sure that we're lifting up um, folks who are indeed the, the folks who have exactly that kind of frontline contact with kids, adults, and older folks. So thanks for that. Uh, well, Dr. McAllister, Dr. McAllister, over to you, sir. Okay. So initially I got involved in AER because I was a student and it was a requirement by Bill Jacobson and everybody knows. <laughs> Good for uh, Bill. Well, but once I got into the um, uh, professional organization, um, it has really been helpful in uh, networking and keeping up with what's actually currently happening in, in the field. Also, um, it allowed me to understand policy. And then, like you said, at first I was a, a teacher. I'm a teacher of O&M originally. I taught at the Arkansas School for the Blind for 15 years. So it allowed me to take the policy into the practice because I was where the rubber meets the road and that was teaching children uh, K through 12 teaching on them. It also allowed me, um, like I said, with the networking to understand that I wasn't alone in some of the things that I was experiencing uh, when I was teaching on them. I could reach out and I could speak with people uh, in the field who were uh, had some more years of experience who could help me through certain situations when it came to teaching on them or um, dealing with um, administration and how mobility was taught. You know, sometimes when you're working as a school teacher, the administrators want to tell you how to teach on them, and that's just not what they could do. And a lot of times they try to tell you when and where to teach it. And so I had, a, I had to, I used the, the AER and some of my contacts to be able to navigate the waters of teaching uh, especially when it came to uh, the bureaucracy of teaching at a school. Um, uh, let me see. Um, also, I, uh, AER has helped me when we have um, different conferences to stay abreast on new techniques, uh, uh, new programs that are, that are out. Um, so I, I, I actually enjoy being in AER. And yes, I've been lax some time in renewing my membership, but I've always renewed it. And um, um, I also was on the AER board, um, and that helped me to really understand the business of AER, which was really important. I, I think as members, we don't really understand the behind the scenes thing that happened with AER to be able to present those uh, conferences. And so I was actually, when I sat on the board, I actually got an opportunity to see behind the veil. And it's a lot of work that goes into uh, providing 
uh, conferences and making sure we uh, advertise and keep up with membership. And so that was really, really helpful to me. Well, and, and, and I, it was a pleasure to have you on, on this previous board. And uh, I know I kind of came on here just in this interim uh, role last March. So you and I didn't get a chance to work much together there. But I know in your role now uh, in, in terms of accreditation, and maybe we'll have a chance to chit chat a little bit more about some of your goals that you have now as, as the chair of our accreditation function at AER. Uh, it'll be fun to hear, hear some of your goals and dreams as we build that program out. Uh, let me um, do two things. Number one, uh, I think, Leanne, you've said this, and I, you will correct me when I screw this up, but I think um, we are for sure in a moment or so going to start to entertain questions uh, or comments, feedback from you all. It could be anything that you want to ask these panelists. Uh, and, and I believe we do that by simply entering that in the chat box. Do I have that? Correct. You correctly. have that correct. You can okay. answer any questions you have in the chat. Do change your two to all panelists and attendees. That means other people would be able to see your questions as well. And that does help some of us and the <laughs> audience know what's being asked. Fantastic. And and uh, when, when, when Neva Fairchild and I were sort of uh, caucusing yesterday, as we are wont to do, at least one-on-one uh, -on -one once a week for a good period of time, uh we both said yes we don't want to just you know have folks ask questions that they don't have to feel folks tomorrow meaning today don't have to feel as though you know your question you can we want to hear from you so if you've got advice for us we want to hear it for sure so with uh, both questions comments etc that we're looking for from you with that i'm going to ask a slightly faster question a fastball question but since our panelists are all uh Oh gosh, how do I complete this metaphor? Since our, our panelists are all, all routinely bad a thousand, I'm sure they'll hit it out of the park. How's that? So you all each had some good things to say about why AER or why CEC or both are important uh, organizations for our field and for you. Uh, but uh, here's a tough one for you. You know, uh, here we are. Uh, there's this little thing called the internet. Uh, people seem to ask Google before they ask another human being uh, often uh, for advice. But that's where they go, whether they should or not. Um, it's a cliche that people don't join member organizations anymore. I mean, I remember reading that, uh, you know, once, once upon a time classic bowling alone, I think a lot of us have, how people have changed. Some people might say um, just about everything that you've all said about AER and CEC, um, okay, right, I can network with people. Uh, I know some folks. I mean, there's this little thing called email. And, Technology will help us out. There's social media. I can do all of that. Um, if I find a decent mentor, I can do that. Why do I have to plunk down membership dues? What exactly, what's in it for me? Uh, what really is the difference between um, doing it on my own versus being part of a group like this? And by the way, can't I, can't I be part of a group without having to formally be a member or part of, what, what, what's in it for me? So I would love for each of you to really dig down a little bit deeper and talk about why, what you think the difference is between those folks who are trying to make it out there on their own versus what our membership associations can really bring to the table that you wouldn't otherwise get without really being involved and being a member. So who wants to hit that one first? I can start, it's Nicole. So I think there, first of all, you can still be involved and not be a member. And I, I say this because I am a teacher prep person and as an undergrad, as my undergrads graduate, they really just don't have the funds. <laughs> they barely are making rent in some situations at 22 years old, starting in the field. But we still welcome you to join. You know, we as we're teaming up with ZVIDB and AER and APH, we're offering free webinars. And why? Because your professional organizations want to get out the information to you. We don't want to hold it hostage. Um, we're nonprofit organizations. Right. I've been starting to build into my program, I register all of my students for both AER and CEC DVIDB. So that's already built in. And throughout their program, I try to show the value of the information that's coming out, the webinars, and really just being able to ask questions. And I think through this past eight months, we've been going through six to eight months, COVID-19, we've had this shift from in-person to virtual. So I think the organizations really saw that there was a need and what 
need it to be done. And we really need to support our teachers out there, our O&M specialists. So conversations were going on <laughs> behind the scenes and we started, okay, they need webinars, they need information. I know that we're getting out to our members information about virtual learning, um, webinars, we're planning a hopefully a live Facebook chat on how to use Google Chrome for people that are blind and visually impaired when teaching because a lot of the students have Chromebooks and don't know how to access them being blind and teachers don't either as well. So uh, you wouldn't get that information unless you were a member um, and then you're struggling, you know, and social media is out there and we're in this digital world as well. And I think that the shift is going con to continue to change over the next six months. But as head organizations, AER, DVIDB, we're really trying to keep up and give the teachers what they need. And I know AER, um, you are having two sessions to hear from the field, October 22nd and November 10th. AER is having, you know, share your thoughts. What struggles are you having? What do you need? Um, what's going on? And you don't have to be a member to participate in that. But I'm, the goal is to take that information and what can we give the field? Because we want to make sure ultimately everyone is served properly and getting what they need. And you don't have, you are missing out if you're not part of one or other or both of the organizations. You're not going to get all the information out there. You know, there's listservs. You can ask questions. I get emailed questions from teachers all the time about, you know, what can I do in this situation? And, you know, we take that and we talk about it. So that's my answer. You really want to stay up to date and get all the information, but you can still be involved and not be a member. We would like you to be a member, but if you can't for some reason, you can still come to there's a lot of things we just throw out there just to get the information out there. Great. Who's next? I'll go, Mark. Um, yeah. Thank you. You know, this is, I'm really glad you raised this question because I think um, it's a struggle for a lot of people to, to find, you know, that chunk of change and just dump it into a professional organization. And um, if I can tell just a quick little story yes, about yes. Um, an occurrence that uh, happened for me when I was a beginning teacher that totally changed my mindset and, and approach towards um, who I am as a career person and a professional. I attended, um, I remember my daughter was only four years old. So those of you who have, who are young, have family starting up, um, you're at the bottom of your uh, salary schedule in your school district and so forth. It's, it's a challenging time. And um, my, my boss at the time uh, pushed me into this conference on creative thinking. And um, it was uh, in Wisconsin, it was one of the most uh, influential professional development activities I ever attended. And there was this message by one of the presenters that uh, really changed my thinking and my mindset. And it was, take 10% of your income every year and invest in your own growth, personal growth, professional mm -hmm. growth, and development, and increase and, and learn and grow in whatever way you want. Now, I don't know if I've always taken 10% of my income and done that, but um, it changed my mindset into thinking, I'm taking, I'm taking some of my money and I'm just reinvesting it in myself by being a member of professional organizations. And I remember coming home from that conference and sharing that news with my husband. <laughs> and <laughs> Because uh, we live very simply, but I do a lot to support him uh, all these years in his career. And, 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 I, and I started out doing that a lot. And I wanted him to support me in, in my career and my growth by supporting me in how we spent our income. Because I wanted to um, uh, reinvest it on, on my professional growth in my career. So that was, that was a fundamental mindset change. 
and and then also evolving from that. So that's kind of the personal. But then um, from uh, the to me, it's it's part of that greater good, and that by investing in my professional organization and being part of that, I'm part of policy change. Um, I, I'm part of uh, social justice. I, I'm part of um, what's going on in, 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 in our context, in our society for people with disabilities. So I, I, I know that sounds a little altruistic, but I believe it. And I believe it's really uh, been important uh, for, and a lot of that stems from our professional organizations. And, and getting those messages out. So that's my thought, thoughts. Well, that last point of yours, music to my ears, being a policy nerd. Uh, thank you for saying that. John, over to you. Okay. So what, what benefits does membership have? To me, um, I, I became a member, and, I, and it really means something to me when um, you, you, you do invest back in yourself. And you do keep up with your membership dues. And, and to me, I was just proud to even be a part of an organization um, where I was able to, to give back and to, um, to, be, uh, to be helpful and to be able to um, make changes in policy. Um, one of the main things that I got out of being a membership, being a member of AER was that on the local level, I got to meet with people right here in my state. Um, uh, some people who had been in profession by the time I got in 20 or 30 years, so they had a, a, a plethora of experience that they could, they could really help me with. Um, one of the best things I did was, to me, was, in, was being able to invest in myself. I'm one of the people who believe that if I can invest in myself, then I know what I'm going to do. I can't tell what the next man is going to do or what they're going to do today or tomorrow, but I know what I'm going to do. And so it was really important for me to invest in myself um, so that I could make a, a, a change in the field. Um, recently, uh, being a member of AER has come with some new benefits. They, they, you know, they have a, a plethora of benefits. They have a benefits package now, like you like can get... Um, hotel discounts, rental car discounts. And yeah, I know a lot of people say, oh, that's a lot of money uh, to pay for this professional organization. But think about it in this way. You'd rather just bet on yourself than bet on something that you don't know that's going to come in. I, I, would, I, would, I would rather bet on myself than bet on something that I knew wasn't going to come in. Um, oh, I had another... Oh, and another thing is that um, when, you, when you're part of this professional organization, it helps you to stay in the loop and you, you get an opportunity to, to go get uh, CEUs. They have free webinars. They have um, it's just a plethora of things. And, and as a student, I know you, uh, you're saying that sometimes you don't have the money, but they do have a student membership. They have, a, a, of course, an active person's membership, and they have an emeritus membership where – they, they, they're going down in scales. And um, what I like most about when I was a professor, I mean, when I was a teacher at the Arkansas School for the Blind is that the school actually paid the money for you and then you paid them back over a period of time. And that was a great program and that and, and it kept me involved. And it also set the tone for me when I left the School for the Blind to always be involved with AER. Really appreciate that, John, very much. Thanks for all your comments. Leanne, I'm gonna ask you before I ask one more question. I just, I'm, I would like to know how many folks we have in the proverbial queue with questions or comments that are relevant to this panel. If you could just give me a quick read on that. And Mark, we do have another um, poll question, which probably would go good with what we're talking about on um, what kind of professional are you? So yep. that's- Yep, okay, me. well, uh, let's do that. Okay, well, I'll push the poll, and while that's going through, then I will kind of read you what's going on in the chat. 
So there are two questions, and if you've attended any webinar I've hosted before, these should look somewhat familiar. What is your job title? And you can pick more than one of those choices. They are an EOT or EOT assistant, which is an ex officio trustee, a teacher of students with visual impairments, an orientation mobility and specialist, vision rehabilitation specialist, therapist, teacher, whatever you choose, um, a college faculty, a student in a college program, a state administrator, a parent. I know we're going to have other, and if you write other, please put other in the chat. And then where are you from? And I completely understand if we do not catch much of our west side, because this is an earlier morning session. While that's going on, we have had comments such as... Well, the, Leanne, if you could just let me know how many you have at the moment. I want to just kind of get a feel uh, for how many. I don't have questions, just more comments about what was being talked about. Oop, one okay. how, how one question now. Huh. Okay, Let, let's, uh, how many of those altogether do you have? Questions approximately. I'm just trying to get a feel uh, for what we're looking at. Four comments and one question. Excellent. So before we turn to those, it sounds like that's perfectly manageable during our question time, which is coming up right after this question. Um, and uh, then you can report Leanne on our poll. Um, I will. So we've had, a, we've had a fine conversation thus far. And I, my third uh, sort of question is not so much a softball question. Maybe it's a little tougher than the, than the last one. Uh, you know, look, sometimes um, people and organizations are fallible, and sometimes we uh, miss the mark, sometimes we do the best that we can with what we got, but we need to be able to think about how we might do a heck of a lot better. I would love for each of you to talk uh, as candidly, and of course as positively, but as candidly as you care to, um, about uh, if you were king and queen, uh, how you would uh, wave that magic wand of yours or whatever, and uh, this is what you'd love to see uh, from your, your professional associations. The, the maybe one or two things you'd like to see change, improve, added, um, uh, because I wanna make sure that we're all having a candid conversation about that, and, and this is a fantastic opportunity to stimulate that conversation and those questions and comments. So who would like to take that fun question? I could awesome. start with Nicole. Um, <laughs> Ryan is pretty quick, my answer. It's yeah. um, to have more involvement. So in CCDIGB, we're always looking for people to be involved and maybe you can't be on the board, but we have so many different subcommittees from every area, you know, that you could think of from deaf blindness, O and M. We, always looking to grow so if you have ideas we want to hear from you and get your ideas we want to give you information so we can only grow if we have help because we're you know I'm only one person the past president the president um, president elect we also have full-time jobs in addition to serving our professional organization so we always look for help so at DVIDB, we are growing every year so this year we're offering more webinars we're doing more partnerships but next year, we would like to take something else on, you know, two years ago, we around four years ago, we started pre conference, um, then webinar. So now next, what can we get to our members? So we're thinking, you know, can we do Facebook chats? Can what can we do? And we want ideas and what are the needs in the field? So we just if I could wave my magic wand, it would be to get more people involved and make sure what we're doing is meeting the needs of the field and we would love more teachers to be involved, um, actual teachers that are teaching so we can support them. Fantastic. John, sounds like you had some comments you're ready to make about how to improve our association. Yeah, I had uh, maybe four things, Mark. Yeah. Um, and, and the first is to do a better job marketing and promoting uh, our professional organizations out to the membership or out to people who are not in the membership to get them involved in the membership. Uh, because, um, as, as you know, um, things don't run by themselves, so we have to increase membership and increase involvement. Um, the second thing I would like to do is to um, uh, increase diversity and inclusion in the field um, and, and, and market, market it to um, people who wouldn't normally come into the field of blindness. So, so we have to do a better job of diversity and inclusion in the field. Right um, the second thing I would do is, um, 
Oh, God. I mean, third thing I would do is if I could just wave a magic wand is yep. to make sure that we didn't work in silos. I noticed that since I've become a professor in this field, everybody's working in a silo and everybody's protective of what they have. When in, when in, in actuality, this is a small field and we need to kind of open up and start sharing ideas so that we could all uh, be successful in the field. That's what I have, Mark. Excellent. Donna? Yeah, so um, I see a, um, a, a comment by Kay Holbrook, and I, I just want to um, share uh, when, Nicole, when you mentioned your uh, students, you know, just barely <laughs> being able to survive at 22 years old, let alone uh, join a professional organization. I remember a number of years ago, uh, Kay, uh, seeing her at a CEC conference, and um, she was there, I believe, Kay, it was your niece. And, and you gifted her a, a membership in, in CEC as a beginning professional, or, and, and maybe supported her in attending the conference, I'm not quite sure. But, um, you know, our, our, I would, you know, membership is always an issue in our organizations. And so I'm just going to set out a challenge. You know, Kay, Kay doing that really uh, resonated with me. And so I started occasionally either supporting somebody attending a, a, a young professional uh, attending the conference with me or buying them an organ uh, organizational membership in one of our organizations. So, um, I, and I just see Kay is saying I'm remembering correctly, so that is very cool. Um, I just want to, uh, those of us who are um, established members, uh, look at if we can reach out. I'm going to challenge us and who can we uh, uh, support uh, buying a member, a gift membership in one of our organizations uh, within the next month. And because uh, that's just where I want to go, Mark, in, in saying that. I respond. appreciate that. Thank you so much. All right, Leanne, uh, do me a favor, at least. Uh, maybe everyone's already get, can see it up on their little screens. No, not yet. Sort of thing work. Uh, let's hear the result of that poll. Okay, I'm going to share both visually and verbally. So those people who identify job titles, remember you could pick more than one. We have about 20% ex officio trustees or assistants, 40% teachers of visual, teachers of students with visual impairments, 20% O&M, 7% vision rehabilitation, 13% college faculty, 10% student in a college program, 12% state administrator, 2% parent, 33% other, and there were lots of others in the chat. You can only put so many options in here. So you have statewide low vision specialists and you have um, people who are uh, deaf blind specialists. So there are other things in there. I couldn't put all those others. And then where you are from, a majority 45% from Southeast, which, which I expected, but we do have uh, at least someone from Alaska or Hawaii and a group, a uh, few from Canada. I do want to ask a question though to both AER and DBIDB. What are other categories than the ones I listed here that could be members of AER and DBIDB? Because I couldn't include all of them and I think we need to talk about who else could be a member. Nicole, you over, over to you first and all. I was going to say the only thing that I see missing would be a person who is blind or visually impaired, you know, themselves, because <laughs> they themselves can use, utilize our organizations. I've had questions from students, um, just college students, not involved in the vision field, but who happen to be blind, that just have questions about policy or what their rights are or things mm -hmm. like that. So I just think that um, individuals with visual impairments could be a member and could benefit very greatly from the organizations. Uh, Nicole, you, you, you're frightening me when you reach inside my brain and read braille thoughts like that. That's, that's a little creepy. Uh, good for you. I, I, that was my first one. Uh, the second thing I would say is, you know, in AER, we've got this little thing called an associate's membership 
Uh, that's what yours truly has been in for a good long while. Why? Because I don't fit in any of those particular professional categories. Uh, most of my professional work has been in the public policy arena. And, and, and I wanted, frankly, as someone who has benefited from professionals to give, give back in my own way. Um, I, you know, I, I, I check out off of AERBVI.org. You're going to see up there uh, divisions. If one of those division titles doesn't match uh, you, uh, there are any number of other ways that you can get involved. But good grief, uh, we could go on for a while about the diversity of uh, folk, uh, technologists, folks who work in the aging arena, ger uh, geriatrics, gerontology. Um, that other category is a pretty big one, and we do need to, especially in polls like this, as we move forward, think about how we can sort of more refine that type, that category, but also lift up those folk, because I think there's a lot of people who are doing a lot of really interesting things, uh, and sometimes we kind of get in this habit of, well, if you're not a TBI or you're one of the professions that ACB or EP certifies, um, or maybe a university type. Well, those are the categories, those are the big ones, and, and the rest aren't maybe on a second tier of importance. That's just not true. Uh, so uh, those are my thoughts. Uh, Leanne, um, so I want to make a priority in the time we have left of questions. Not that I don't love every comment, I'm sure, that's in this chat box. Can you direct us to at least the one question I know we have? Maybe there are more, but let's pose whatever questions are in the chat to our panelists. Okay, <clears throat> I gotta scroll back up to catch some of those. So the first one is, we need the professional organizations to establish standards for our field that protect us at work, even had trouble delivering the ECC in the community and ever, sorry, ever have trouble delivering the ECC in the community and using CEC standards to justify your practice? Uh, Nicole, over to you. Yes, um, and the ECC is an area I think, and maybe we as EC, DBI, DB could look at more if when, because we don't hold the O&M standards as EC. So we have TBI and deaf blind. So AR might have more. We're related to O&M and the ECC. I'm sure they do. Um, but you're right. We we should post more on the ECC. So we take standards take a very long time. So we got done the TBI. Um, and we now are working on the deaf blind. Um, but that is a good, we have position papers and there is, that is embodied about the expanded core curriculum as teachers of the visually impaired, they have to engage in each of the areas of the ECC. So I always encourage my students or people at ask to print off that position paper. What is the role and responsibility of a TBI? Um, because it does list out the areas of the ECC and you are responsible for that. Um, we don't have specific standards um, listed that have to be addressed. However, they are embodied in some of our TBI standards and I know there's ECC and O&M standards. So going through and highlighting the standards often works with administrators and printing out that role and responsibilities of the TBI and highlighting because it is a liability issue if you're not addressing the ECC. So showing this um, document to administrators often does help in highlighting this is the ECC, here's where it's mentioned. And that's what I recommend doing. Great, Donna or John? I'm gonna jump in here um, real quick. Nicole, I'm really glad you mentioned position papers. Uh, I, I don't think we've said that earlier in, in our panel. And um, both the position papers from um, AER and um, uh, CEC have been a really important foundational content for me. And I've used them a lot and I push them out a lot. I usually always have them downloaded into a file on my computer. So they're readily available for me to send to um, people I'm working with. And, um, I send, and I send them to administrators to, to help share um, uh, what, what teachers should be doing. In terms of the ECC, Nicole, I use that uh, role and function of the teacher all the time. So that's what I have to say, Mark. 
And I did John, work up oh, on go ahead, share all of our position papers. So they are on our website, which I did share earlier and is on the PowerPoint and I can post again. So I do, if you need something from the position papers, I recommend, and we are always updating these. So we're in the process of updating older ones and posting new ones. Um, some are up for public comment, but please use our position papers to support your cause. Excellent. John, over to you if you uh, want to pitch in here. Um, yes, um, one of the main things I did when I was teaching, when I was teaching, is I also made sure that I brought this, uh, the on m code of ethics up to my profession, my, uh, my administrators. Um, and I had the, I had the, I guess, the pleasure of working at a school for the blind. So most, most everything was understood. I didn't really have a problem with uh, ex explaining things or why I was doing things. But sometimes when they got, when I got new administrators, I did have some pushback. And those were the times where I did have to um, look at the professional code of ethics, uh, give them position, position papers on uh, what the role of an on instructor was at a public school. And um, it was most oftentimes it was like a miscommunication thing and i really didn't have to justify but there was there were times when i did get new new professionals new administrators who were not accustomed to the field of blindness and didn't know anything about the field of blindness i had to bring them up to speed on what was actually happening in the field and so i, I also I always like i said use the code of ethics and uh position papers to get that point across especially when they were um, attempting to make me do something outside the scope and practice of my field. Does that actually happen? People make you, force you to do things that you shouldn't do? I, I, shame, shame on them. Yes, sir. I appreciate that's. I really appreciate those comments. Uh, Leanne, if you start to queue up the next question while I make a 30 second pitch here. I for, am ready when you're ready. For the AERBVI.org website, not only can you see our position papers up there, of which there are, uh, should be plenty, um, I know all too keenly uh, how much our website needs uh, rehabilitation uh, services, and uh, we're in the process of doing that. I also want to mention that, and I, I assume, Nicole, uh, I'm embarrassed, I don't know the answer to this, uh, that CEC uh, DVI does this as well. Certainly CEC, Council for Exceptional Children as a whole, certainly does this activity. In AER, uh, we've got this lovely process called a resolutions process. And uh, like many membership organizations, AER, uh, associations, AER's membership is the highest authority uh, in our uh, organizational structure. So certainly another way uh, that you can participate, and frankly, one ride. We don't just let anyone and their brother vote uh, on these. You got to be a member if you want to be a part and vote. And uh, and so there's yet another reason to pitch in, uh, to be part of your professional association, to join, vote, participate in those discussions with resolutions. Yeah, okay. Resolutions can sometimes be dreadfully boring and long. On the other hand, they have demonstrated over and over again to be uh, clear crisp statements to be used, John, exactly the way that you've described the position papers. And they've been very forceful and are forceful statements about how this community strongly feels about an issue or a policy or a practice. And, uh, and so we've been um, very proud, I think, in AER of uh, pushing forth through resolution by having the membership speak for itself about these particular issues. Nicole, just remind me at least, uh, does CCDVI do that as well? Yes, and I was going to say, um, even to vote or make comment on the standards, so the deafblind standards will go out for comment. You need to be a member to comment and vote. Our position papers go out. That's for public comment, but to be able to vote. So, and to have any voice in the voting process, even selecting our board, who potentially are working on all these things, you have to be a member to have a voice. Um, so, yes, we do a voting process on everything as well, and you have to be a member. Great, Leanne, next question, please. Okay, hold on, I'm also getting my captioner switch ready to happen. Okay, right. so this one kind of goes along with what you were talking about. 
may uh, the professional organizations are they being promoted or marketed to school administrators or agencies that hire TBIs and O&Ms? Many of the employers do not know that these exist, as well as some of our administrators who probably could belong don't even belong. How do I get them to engage? Okay, Nicole, you over to you. I always recommend sharing about what we do and the mission, and that's always on our website. Um, and administrators, especially CEC was offering free membership and they have changed the membership structure. So it is a lot cheaper than it used to be, but showing for administrators the cost effectiveness. So I know us at DVIDB, we offer free trainings and webinars. So two members. So it benefits, you get the ACVREP credits. We offer that for pretty much all our webinars, our pre-conference um, for free throughout the year compared to paying for each webinar, pre-conference, things like that. It, the, the balance is a lot better. So you're saving money in the long run. And I know with AER and CEC, if you're a member, if to the annual conference or biannual conference, the rate drops as well. Um, and showing that these are where the standards come from. So if as an administrator overseeing TVIs, they have to know what the standards are and maybe they want to say as they're being updated um, and us to support them and answer questions. So they cannot do that unless they're members. So I think it's showing them what we offer specifically and what our missions are. And we've been trying really hard at CEC, DVI, DB, um, with Dr. Mackenzie Saviano, really updating our website and keeping it current and providing information to so you can utilize to administrators and get them involved. So Nicole, uh, this Donna, is Amy. I'm sorry Don, to jump Donna, in. Can, Donna can and, you hear me? and John. Yes, hold on just a minute, Amy. Um, okay. Donna, Donna and John, if you uh, could weigh in in a second about some of your advice on how we can better market uh, membership. I think this idea of reaching out to schools and other groups is so critical. Uh, I would be, it would be dereliction of duty if I didn't mention that one of the things that we are doing at AER this fall is partnering with Vision Serve Alliance, which is the essentially trade association of private agencies, uh, private nonprofit agencies serving the blind or visually impaired. And uh, they uh, put on two conferences at least every year. Of course, this one is going to be a virtual event. Uh, when you attend the Vision Serve Alliance conference, you get to hobnob with the CEOs and presidents of folks at the Lighthouse, at industries programs, at schools for the blind, you name it. Um, and uh, because of a partnership we've arranged with them, we uh, are marketing to our members an opportunity to join in that at half of the normal registration rate. So if you're an AER member, you get to be part of that event and network with folks like that uh, at a discounted rate, and it's a golden opportunity. You also get up to 15 uh, CEs for that exercise. Should we be doing more? I know AER has been doing more of this uh, in the past over the course of time. We are looking at how we can reach out exactly to what you're talking about to sort of formalize our relationship uh, with um, other corporate groups and certainly the public agencies but uh, Donna and John, to you, what, what would recommendations you make uh, about um, how the organ our associations could be better marketers? Well, one or one. Go ahead, go John. Ahead. Go ahead, Donna. You're fine. <laughs> Thank you. Lady Fur. Yeah, so, I mean, the, this is, you know, the age-old challenging question. And, and, and just thinking about leadership uh, within organizations and administrators, um, my experience is, you know, when I was part of an or organization where I had somebody in charge, um, they were either, it seemed to me, they were either part of professional organizations themselves or not. And, and and when I think about all, all the uh, contexts I'm working in, in now, Mark, um, variety of school settings, variety of organizations. I have no idea with a lot of, actually a lot of people I'm uh, working alongside as if they uh, are members of professional organizations in general, let alone the people who are in, in the VI field if they're members. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start asking people 
are, you know, do you have a, a membership and especially administrators and, and um, just in general. So I'm just thinking that tomorrow night, um, my school district at local school district here in Cambridge, Minnesota, it has a referendum up to the voters. Um, we, we have uh, one of the lowest um, uh, state funded school districts. And so we're doing a referendum and I'm hosting um, an informational gathering outdoors on, uh, at my home and the superintendent of our school district is gonna be there. You know what, I'm gonna ask him if he's a member of a professional organization as a superintendent. There's gonna be other administrators there from my local school district. I'm gonna ask him. And, and because that sets the tone mark, whatever organization you're in, whether it's BI, you know, people or not, is how do they value professional organizations as a professional in education? So I'm gonna, gonna like, you know, set this up on my radar, radar and, and start engaging more people in the, in the question. Excellent. I also John, was going to say administrators are also involved in CASE through CEC. So CASE is the administrators group at CEC and a lot of administrators are involved with CASE. Yeah. We share information with CASE through DVIDB. So they do get the information there as well. And Mark, I know we have to move forward to our next, but if I don't know if we want to wrap this one up and then there will be time at the end that you can ask any of us questions as well. Yeah, so that's what I'm trying to do. John, over to you. Okay, so uh, I'm going to answer both the questions, uh, one from Mark and one from in the chat room. Uh, first off, I've, I've had the pleasure of working at a school for the blind, so I didn't have to speak with my administrators about um, being, becoming members of AER because they already were. And it's kind of a, uh, at the Arkansas School for the Blind, it's a requirement that if, if you have somebody working at the School for the Blind, that they, number one, have to be um, uh, in one of the specialized areas of blindness or know something about it. And number two, uh, they, they have to become a, a member of one of the organizations. That's a requirement. Um, so if I was in a situation where I had to tell or had to um, get my administrators to know about these, I, I would simply just ask them. And then if they didn't know anything about it, I would talk to them uh, about the professional organizations and what we do provide, which would be the um, professional development hours and the contact hours that you have to have as a vision, uh, as a vision professional in order to stay uh, certified. Um, talk to them about the CEUs, the different conferences, and um, why, why those things are helpful to you and to the staff, they would be more helpful to the staff. And so I would try to get them involved in that way. Now on to Mark's question, how to better market. Um, one of the things that I would do is uh, market to market better is to start contacting school districts um, so that because a, a public school district knows nothing about blindness and visual impairments. <laughs> they, they, some, some of them don't. I'm, I'm just going to be flat out honest with you, especially here in Arkansas where I am. Some of them have no clue um, and they don't even know that we exist. And so uh, sometimes you have to, uh, to, to reach out to those, to those school districts, to those superintendents, to those principals. Um, the second thing I would do is I would um, most oftentimes, I know here in Arkansas, that um, individuals who are blind and vision impaired, they have um, the vision of the blind, the vision of the services of the blind workers. I would, uh, case workers, I would get those, uh, get in contact with those people because they have a better um, relationship with the school districts. And that way they could go in and speak with the school districts about our professional organization. And uh, second, uh, one thing I, I would do to, to better market um, our professional organization in particular is to talk about the benefits of being a member. Um, so a lot of times when a person pays for something, they want to know what are the benefits of the payments? What's, what, what, are my, what are my benefits? If membership has, has its privileges, what are my privileges? And so I think that currently the AER has a membership benefits package that is really nice. If you don't know about it, you need to go on the website and check it out. It is really nice. You, you get a lot of discounts at a lot of places. And I think that those things have to be highlighted 
so that people know that they're just not throwing the money out the window. There are some benefits that come with paying my money and becoming a member. That's all I have. Thanks so much. We are way out of time. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, panelists. Uh, really appreciate it. Nicole, I'm kicking the ball back over to you to queue up our next presenter. I'm looking forward to hearing about it. Yes. And if you have general questions for any of us, you could always pop them in the chat. And if we have time at the very end, we will come back to it. Yep. But I'm very yeah, yeah. excited um, to introduce Dr. Penny Rosenblum to talk about what working together to expand what we know, um, specifically about the study um, that she kind of spearheaded and brought a lot of people together on flattening accessibility. So Penny, I'm going to turn it over to you. Well, well, great. Thank you so much, Nicole and Mark and uh, Leanne and everybody else who's here. We're actually going to talk about very briefly about the flat and inaccessibility study. I think most of us here are educators. So we're really going to talk about the access and engagement study. So um, I, the first question I had heard was, is the access and engagement study out? Um, and the executive summary was posted yesterday. So I'm going to go ahead and put that link for you in the chat window. It's also for you in the PowerPoint. So I want to tell you a little bit about the uh, process we went through and what the access and engagement study is. So initially in March, when we were all kind of looking for toilet paper, uh, Troy Otio, the CEO of IRA, contacted um, Dr. Kirk Adams, the CEO of American Foundation for the Blind, AFB, where I'm the director of research, and said, hey, can we collaborate? Can we do a little survey? Well, the little survey became a big survey. And the big survey is called Flattened Inaccessibility. And when um, that report is on the AFB website, I give you the URL down at the bottom of the slide so you can go to that. Um, it's almost 100 pages. It talks about how COVID-19 impacted the lives of 1,921 adults with visual impairments in the month of April. When we posted the announcement about that survey, Dr. Tina Hertzberg contacted me and said, hey, could you um, work with AFB and me to put out a survey for TVIs and O&M specialists and families of children with visual impairments? So in a very short amount of time, Tina Hertzberg, Tiffany Wild, myself, and some other folks who helped out along the way put together a survey. So we'll go to the next slide and I will share with you that we had, so the next slide, where I will share with you that we had 20 organizations and companies that then shared information about that survey. APH put up the access and engagement website for us. So the companies that tweeted, posted, did all these things about access and engagement were IRA, ACB, REP, AFB, ACB, APH, AER, CNIB Foundation, DBIDB, Cosby, Humanware, sorry, we have low vision here, National Braille Press, NOAA, Objective Ed, Perkins Seedlings, TSBVI, University of South Carolina Upstate, um, Vision, vision Laws Rehabilitation Canada, Vision Serve Alliance, and Vespero. And I wanted to read that list to you because you were going, wow, that was a long list and that was fast. And I think that's an important thing we need to recognize. How often do we bring 20 entities together in a short period of time to support our students with visual impairments, their families, and their uh, TBIs and O&M instructors to understand how education is being impacted by COVID-19? We collected a lot of data, and therefore we needed a lot of analysis and co-authors. So on our next slide, you're going to see the um, individuals who have written the access and engagement report. Myself, Tina Hertzberg, Tiffany Wild, Catherine Botsford, Deneen Fast, and Justin Kaiser are probably names many of you know. But then you're looking at the other names and you're going Leanne Cook, Michelle Hicks, um, Jasmine DeGrant, and Rhett McBride. Who are they? Well, you know, folks, we are so fortunate in this field. We're here to talk about collaboration. These are volunteers. Leanne is a TVI. Michelle is a doctoral, is a TBI and is also a doctoral student beginning at Virginia Commonwealth University. Kim Avila from George Mason is on her committee. Um, Jazz, Jasmine DeGrant is a uh, master student of Justin Kaiser's down at the University of Kentucky. And Rep McBride, Tina Hertzberg was on his doctoral committee. He was supposed to be in schools in the spring collecting data 
uh, that didn't quite work out. And so his committee said, well, if you can find a national project to be involved with, and Gina said, I know just the national project. These folks started out as volunteers. They worked so hard and were so committed to what we were doing to be able to support our students with visual impairments that the faculty members decided that they all were also co-authors. So I share this with you because not only did we have organizations and companies collaborate together to help in the design and give input on the survey to send out blogs, tweets, emails to their constituents, their customers, whoever um, is in their network about, hey, please participate in the survey. But then we pulled together this phenomenal group of um, individuals to and analyze and present the report. Next slide, please. So this report, as I said, right now we have the executive summary available to you as of yesterday afternoon. Anticipate the full report towards the end of the month. I always am learning to hedge a little bit at AFB, and that's because we have a, a very strong commitment to accessibility. So we will not release the report until it is fully accessible online and fully accessible in the PDF. And that takes a little bit of time, I'm learning. There's a lot to learn here at AFB. Okay, you are one of the first groups I'm telling about our town hall. So next week, if you start checking your inbox um, or social media, you'll start to see announcements about a three, se three series town hall that AFB is hosting. The first one on October 23rd, these are, let me say, these are all at 2 p.m. Eastern. The first town hall on October 23rd will focus on transportation, healthcare, and voting. And we will talk a little bit about the flatten and accessibility report in those three areas, but primarily it will be discussion. The town hall on October 29th will focus on employment and technology, again, using the flatten and accessibility as our backdrop. The town hall that most of you, I think, will be the most interested in will happen on November 10th. For that town hall, it'll be myself, Tina Hertzberg, and Tiffany Wild as your, as your hosts. We will do a brief presentation about the education aspect of access and engagement. I'll also briefly talk about um, what we're doing from flatten and accessibility from college students and those who were in O&M program training to to, to build their O&M skills or their rehab skills or we're getting ready to go to a dog guide program. And then primarily we'll also talk about education of our children from access and engagement. So you might want to put November 10th, 2 p.m. Eastern on your calendar and look for more information. Um, as, as I said earlier and I put in the chat, you can go to afb.org forward slash access engagement to get the executive summary. When you go there to get the executive summary, there's a place where it says sign up. If you sign up, then you will get a link when the access and engagement report becomes available. And again, I hope later this month. You'll also start to get uh, very infrequent emails from AFB about research opportunities. So I encourage you to sign up. I promise we won't spam you. I promise we won't sell you. We will not be trying to get you to get a free account for you know, some bogus thing in a foreign country. I promise. Okay, next slide, please. So I was asked to talk a little bit about collaboration and, and how access and engagement and flatten and accessibility have been collaborative efforts in this field. I'm very fond of this, I know overused saying, but truly I think Helen Keller really um, says it here when we say, alone we can do so little, together we can do so much. I started as the director of research at AFB in January, not quite knowing what I was getting into. And I was, you know, muddling along in January, February, in the beginning of March to make sure that, you know, I was doing what they were asking me to do. And when COVID hit, my world turned upside down, just like everybody else's. Um, but I have to say, sometimes there is a silver lining. And believe me, I know people who have been sick and I, I know some people who have lost loved ones. So I'm not trying to say that that COVID is a good thing. I want my life back and I want those people to not have experienced the, the pain and the loss. But for me on a professional level, there has been a small silver lining to COVID in the sense that I have gotten to work with more people. I have gotten so energized by seeing this field come together to support this effort. So it takes time and it takes effort. 
but we really can work together um, no matter you know what our beliefs are about how children should get services, no matter what our role is, no matter whether we have money or we don't have money in our organization, we all can contribute and we all can support education of our students with visual impairments. Um, I really want to talk about mentorship for a moment. And I think I loved what Donna McNear shared during the panel about you know, sponsoring somebody to go to a conference or buying them a membership. I, I think most of you who know about me or know me personally know that I was at the University of Arizona for 20 years. I was at Florida State for two years before that. Um, one of the hardest things for me about, in a sense, leaving academia or what I, I perceived about leaving academia was that I wasn't going to get to mentor new faculty uh, doctoral students, master's level students, and I was going to really miss that piece. I was so wrong. I am really enjoying being mentored, but also getting to mentor. And I mentioned to you the, the four volunteers that we had. Um, it's been a delight to mentor them, and I also have a couple other volunteers. So I'm going to put a plug in. If you want to learn more about research, if you want to just, hey, you know, you're sitting around at night and you just cannot watch anything else on Netflix and you wouldn't mind looking through some data for us or reading some articles and taking some notes on them, I'd love to have you join our AFB volunteer team. And we have a blog post um, about our four of our volunteers on the AFB website under blog posts. Um, gathering and reporting data is only the first step. And this is why we're having the town halls. This is why we are starting to have our public policy arm, um, Stephanie Enyart and Sarah Mallier, begin to get, develop a plan to reach out to different organizations, both in the vision field, but more importantly, outside the vision field, to reach out to politicians. So we are developing a very, um, um, not concise, the opposite of concise, <laughs> very expansive plan to share these results. I absolutely, and I know I can speak for my nine co-authors, do not want everybody to say, oh, that's a really nice report, cute kid on the cover, and then like you bookmark it and you never go back to it. That is not the intent here, folks. We want you to use this report. When we put out Flatten and Accessibility, I emailed the 100 or 1,500 or so people I had email addresses from who had participated and left their email address. And within half an hour, I got this email going, well, that's really nice. What are you going to do with it? Meaning UAFB. And I was like, kind of looked at that email. I thought, what do you mean me, AFB? What about you, visually impaired adult person? And I, if that person is ever on anything, I, I mean this, um, I truly appreciate this person's email. But it really sparked for me that we each need to advocate. Adults with visual impairments, use flatten and accessibility and, and share about how your life has been impacted with transportation healthcare and use the data to back it up. Once you get the access and engagement report, you are a TBI, use data from that TBI section, that professional section to back up the experiences that you're having. If you're a family member, use data you know, from the family section. Everybody use data throughout. You will find when you get the access and engagement executive summary, that there's a page that has recommendations. In each of the sections of the report, the early intervention, the preschool, the school age, um, the TBI, and the O&M section, you'll find at the end of each of those five sections recommendations. And we've divided the recommendations out for families, for professionals, for administrators, and for policymakers to try to help people be able to tune in on the section that they need. Um, I absolutely cannot say enough about the dedicated people in our field. I, I cannot tell you how many thousands of hours on both reports have been put in, put in um, by people who, who were not paid for their time, who are doing the work because they truly believe in what we're doing at AFB as the leader of, of the studies, but what we're all doing as a field to ensure that people with visual impairments from, from birth to the grave have what they need to be successful, to be independent. Um, and then during these unprecedented times, we must all support each other. I really firmly believe, believe this is so important. Our teachers, our families, our O&M specialists, our administrators, 
um, our visually impaired person who sent me an email yesterday through, through one of my collaborators about the challenges of getting a COVID test when she was a non-driver and how, how she had to figure out how to do that when her community has drive-through testing or says, go, go do an urgent care, but sit in your car until you're called in. How do you get a COVID test? You know, we know about our students, 85% of the TBIs in the study reported they had at least one student who was doing online instruction who was having accessibility issues, 85% folks. So you're going, wow, there sounds like there's a lot to this report. Well, there is. How can you learn more before that report gets posted? Well, join me in Pacific time. That'll be me tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. Pacific, 10 a.m. Eastern. We're going to go over the report a little bit. And I believe I have one more slide, Miss Nicole, or Dr. Miss Nicole. I don't have one more slide. So again, <laughs> um, access and engagement, afb.org forward slash access engagement. You can get the executive summary today and the report hopefully in the next month. And there should be one more slide, and that slide should tell you that. Um, we are going to do access and engagement too. I'm very pleased that AFB is allowing um, my, myself and my research team to spearhead the next effort and that my co-authors are all still on board. God love them. Um, and so we hope to launch access and engagement too the last week in October. Um, there's going to be a lot to do. And I want to just say one more thing about that. I want you to listen to me very carefully. So stop checking your email. <laughs> oh. Okay. One of the issues with research in our field that is very evident in both flattening and accessibility and access and engagement is that we tend to get, and I'm going to generalize here, but my data shows this, or our data shows this, white female women connected with the internet. Okay? This is a problem. Oops, somebody's mic's on. This is a problem for us because we all know that we have a much more diverse population of people with visual impairments and family members and not as diverse a representation of professionals, and that's another issue for another day. When access and engagement two comes out, I am asking every single person on this call to reach out to one family who may not be connected on the internet, may not have a device to sit down and do this, may feel overwhelmed with, you know, well, what if I don't know the answer to a question? And support that family in getting the, the survey done. And that might mean that you set up a phone call with them and you read them the survey. And if they're not quite sure what a Perkins Braille writer is, you explain it. It's that typewriter thing that your kid has been using for the last two years. Um, if we each reach out to one person and support them in doing the survey, we will know a lot more about what's going on with our children with visual impairment from families who may not be on these listservs, blog, get blog posts, get tweets about the survey. So I want you each to make a promise to me that you'll do that. I hope to see many of you tomorrow for my session. I am totally not in charge of this, so somebody tell me if I get to add um, some questions. So Penny, it's Nicole. So we have about two more minutes till we'll go to our next panel, two to three. And I know Melody raised her hand. So in the next two minutes, if someone has a specific question for Penny, you could type it in. And Melody, you did raise your hand and Leanna wrote back in the chat, can you type your question? So um, if anyone has a question, and I just wanna say that I'm very excited about this study and I think that it was amazing getting all those organizations and people together to make it happen while we're waiting. Mm -hmm. the moment I'm not seeing any questions they were thankful for the link to be able to engage okay. all right um, and Thank if you. anyone does have questions um, for Penny that you didn't get in in time please put it in the chat and if Penny doesn't see it I will make sure to get it to her okay well I'll, I'll I'm gonna turn off my camera but I will hang out but Nicole if you would just text me if I get a question yep. I'll come answer it thank, thank you all you, for Penny. your time right, Penny thanks good job so next we're going to go on to our second panel and this is going to be focused around um, working together for better outcomes for our students and clients. 
And our panel is going to consist of Dr. Amy Parker, Mark Reigert, and Neva Fairchild. So Mark had already introduced himself, so I'm going to turn over to Dr. Parker to introduce herself. Good morning, everyone from the West Coast. This is Amy Parker. First, let me just say I'm, I'm really thrilled to, to be here. I was honored to be asked to be on this panel to talk about um, ways in. I've been really thrilled with comments that, that Penny and Donna and others have made. One thing, um, I, I'm the immediate past president of CEC DVIDB. And I'm at Portland State University. I coordinate an orientation and mobility program, but I'm also a family member. And I'm going to be speaking a little bit about what it means when we collaborate for people who are not represented in, um, in some of our programs or even in some of our personnel prep programs historically. I really appreciated what Penny said about being more mobilized around helping people who aren't represented often in our research and in our data to be represented. That's a really important role that we can play and that all of our members have to play. So I'll, I'll leave it for the, the questions, Nicole, and let others introduce themselves. Neva, can you introduce yourself? Hello, everyone. My name is Neva Fairchild. And for an accessible description, I am a 64-year-old white female who is visually impaired, wearing a maroon shirt, and I have white hair. And you look marvelous, that's all I can say. But. <laughs> so yesterday in an AER webinar, I learned that accessible descriptions is a part of making a a video conference like this accessible to everyone in the audience and I thought it was a pretty neat idea. <laughs> I have the privilege of serving as AER president uh, for the past two months so I'm still very much a rookie. I've served on the International AER board several times throughout my career starting in 2008 representing different division clusters. I work for the American Foundation for the Blind as National Aging and Vision Loss Specialist. And right now my duties are confined to the Blind Leaders Development Program, which is not really about aging, but is a need that AFB had. And so I'm, you know, other duties as assigned, y'all have that on your job description too, I bet. And uh, so I'm getting to work with 16 fabulous fellows and their mentors who are all blind or visually impaired on developing their leadership skills over the next, well, we still have about nine months to go with this cohort. Great, thank you, Neva. And we appreciate the three of you being on this important panel. Um, I was my first question to get it going and this is going to follow the same format as the first panel. So if you come up with a question while any of our panelists are talking, please pop it in the chat and Leanne and myself will keep track of the questions throughout. But I just wanted to ask about how important is reporting numbers for states and the census to provide accurate services and for our organizations to work together to serve each other. So um, we know reporting is very important, but what, how do you see reporting in your eyes for Amy, Mark, or Neva? Nicole, this is Neva. Mm -hmm. I had the privilege of attending the Vision Serve Alliance Leadership Conference last November, um, representing AER at that event. And in every one of the breakout sessions, which this was a very different format, we decided what the breakout sessions were going to be at the beginning of each day, and you went to what interested you. And in every single breakout session, the fact that we don't know our numbers for any age group of people who are blind or visually impaired, who are, even those who are getting services are tough to collect in any kind of an accurate way. And for those who aren't getting services but need them and don't get them because they don't know about them or they live out in the boonies or for whatever reason, we don't know those people exist. So the census and the associated uh, surveys like the American communities, and et cetera, 
are absolutely vital. We cannot go to our policymakers and say, we need more professionals, we need more service providers, we need more services, we need more funding if we don't know how many people are out there needing our services. Thank you, Neva. Mark or Amy? Thank you. Um, and I, I, I couldn't agree more with Neva. It is not knowing who we are serving, not knowing those numbers, not being, we're asked all the time. This is one of the ways that, that people want to hear from us. And sometimes I'm, I'm guilty of this as well. I think I'm, I'm not the best expert to, to speak. Let me, let me ask Mark Reichert, who spent so much more time thinking about these issues. Let me reach out to Neva, who has dedicated herself to aging, transportation issues, access for older people. Let me reach out to these people that, that I respect. And when you are in that moment, when you are at that table, when you are in Eastern Washington or in rural Oregon, you are representing the field. You are representing the needs um, of the field. And I'm, I apologize if you hear some background noise at our house, it's, it's actually kind of been musical chairs this morning. I'm, I'm living like most of you are with multiple people online in different rooms going to high school. I also wanted to speak to this from um, the perspective of being a sister of an adult who has multiple disabilities and is deafblind. When Melody was born in 1970, she was one of the first children to be allowed to go to public school in 1975 when it was time for her to start going to kindergarten. She was the one of the first beneficiaries of IDEA law. Um, and it was a really interesting experience being her sister. I'm 18 months younger than her. People often look at us both uh, and think that I'm older than she is. Um, she has this saying too, she says, you know, I was the firstborn until you came along, Amy. So I don't even know entirely what that means, but <laughs> in her mind, you know, I, I'm kind of this, this bossy younger sister. She, I got to witness her ride what people fondly called the short bus, the smaller vehicle that brought her to school. We, although we were going to the same school buildings, Melody and I rode on different buses at that time. Now, Melody has a visual impairment. She was born with ONH. We now know Melody has CVI. She was born with CVI, but she had multiple disabilities. And she was known in that time as, uh, I'm just gonna use words that were used at that time, the little retarded girl. She had mental retardation. She was a little special needs girl with multiple disabilities and cerebral palsy. Now we don't use those words anymore and our field has certainly evolved. But when I was speaking with her the other day, I recognized something really vital, that the essential change in our field of Melody not being recognized as having a visual impairment and what that meant in terms of her lack of access to qualified staff, in terms of any accommodations that she could have received that would have allowed her to better participate in instruction, those are still the same issues that we're facing today. Many of the children with multiple disabilities and adults with additional disabilities are not recognized as having visual impairments. And Mark and I were having a conversation about this recently with some other advocates on, on a policy discussion where we've often heard this in the field and you will hear this from administrators. We were talking about administrators who might say, oh, vision loss, vision, visual impairment, that's the least of this person's concerns. And people probably said that about Melody. And Melody, it wasn't recognized until she was an adult, actually, that she had visual impairment. She was always thought that she couldn't read because she wasn't smart enough to read. But what it actually was is she wasn't appropriately accommodated. So Melody can read, she has sight words now, and she uses those words to make a grocery list. She uses those words um, to read and to communicate with family, to identify when she needs help, to support her throughout her day. So I think that the census, it's time for us all to come together and not simply rely on our experts, but to understand these issues as members 
and to be able to act together when there are times when we can address these issues by developing a better census, both for children, but also for adults. It's going to take all of us to do that because we are a low incidence field. So that's what I wanted to share from uh, a family member perspective. Thank so you. Nicole, I, 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 I don't, oh, I'm gonna have to turn off this, hold on, speech off. So um, I'm gonna mangle this. I don't even remember the name of the prayer, but it's the famous prayer. Uh, the, 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 the interpolation I'm gonna to give to it is, you know, give me the, the strength to change the things that I can, to embrace the things I can't, and the wisdom to know the difference. This is one of those times when we know indeed, or we should have the wisdom to know the difference about whether we can change these problems or not. Some of you might say, that's easy for you to say, I've been in this field, Mark, for twice as long as you have, but in case that would be 50 years. And we've been talking about this for a very long time. So it's very cute of you to think that we can actually change this. Um, we might be wrestling with these whole issues for another 50 years. And I would tell you, if that's your attitude, frankly, I don't think there's very many people on this call that have that attitude, but if that's the case, I would ask you to reconsider. It's the most polite way I can put it. Because we have options for changing it. Uh, we have something at the special education level called the Alice Cogswell and Ansel of Macy Act. I promised my fellow uh, panelists I wasn't going to get into a whole lot of legislation and regulation, and I'm, and I'm not going to. But I will tell you that the whole, one of the key objectives of that legislation is to compel the U.S. Department of Education and to compel states to count blind and visually impaired children, particularly those children, to identify and count those kiddos, especially those who have additional disabilities, in a way that doesn't thwart the fact that they have blindness and vision impairment or other sensory disabilities. Some of you I know, um, I think of Texas, uh, there's 50 states and six territories. If I start dropping names, I'm gonna forget somebody, but we'll just single out Texas because they like to be singled out. I think people in Texas think they've got this whole count business wrapped up and maybe you do. Uh, but if that's the case, then you're the exception that proves the rule and, and most states could do an awful lot more. What does that mean for anyone who's listening to this panel right now? It means just because we don't have something called, at least very formally structured and, and, and active at the moment called the national agenda, doesn't mean that you at the state level can't do all the things that our previous panel talked about in terms of gather the position papers, put together your packet of resolutions material. And by the way, you also happen to know a heck of a lot more than anybody else that you're gonna talk to, uh, whomever you talk to about blindness and vision impairment. And you can work at the state level to say, look, whatever we're doing here at the state level is not working. Uh, we know that there are more folk, more kids especially, I'm just using that as one example, but it's true in the adult services and, and older folks arenas as well. That there are a lot more of quote unquote our people than you are recognizing. Now I'll just give you one little anecdote and I appreciate, I love Amy hearing your story. I've heard it several times now and, we, and you had the opportunity to, to mention it when you and, uh, and, and others uh, uh, were preparing for meetings um, with the US Department of Education, et cetera, et cetera, that we recently had. And I have to say, I, I was really kind of struck by the fact that the, um, and it's, we're not telling tales on the school, it's a public meeting, um, that representatives of the Department of Education yet again um, seem to be clinging to this notion that maybe the size of the population of blind and visually impaired kids is, is, is maybe shrinking and it's not nearly the size that some of us think it is. And that's pretty disturbing. And even when you hear that from folks who mean well, uh, there are folks up there who even uh, are responsible for um, helping our colleagues at the American Printing House for the Blind do, do their work. And you hear that, that kind of uh, analysis is, is pretty frustrating. We hear this a lot because I think there's this assumption that blind and visually impaired people, I'll just pick on us because that happens to be one of my personal experience, that we're monolithic, you know, and you're blind only and so we're gonna count you that way. It's an absurd way of reckoning the needs of a child, a person of working age or an older person particularly in the, in, the, in, the, in the aging thing, and Neva, I hope you'll comment on this because there's probably no one more expert on this little panel than, than you for sure. Uh, people in the, in, the, in the aging sector do not, you know, consumers, 
don't by and large identify themselves as folks who are blind or visually impaired. Like my dear sweet mama, she just can't see too well. And they're not necessarily ever going to identify as one of our people. So I think, you know, there are really two challenges. We need to recognize that we don't have to be victims about this count issue. It's going to take a little bit of spine stiffening on our part to whether it's the Coswell Macy bill or regulations working with the Department of Education, continually advocating with them on the kiddo level, or even the working age adults or the rehab level. But for sure, in that broader issue of you know, the largest population of folks we have are in that older folks uh, sector. And yet a lot of those folks don't even think that they're quote unquote, our people. And so that's a real challenge. How do we then modify the way we talk about our population? I'm look, I, I'm proud to be blind with a capital B. There are a lot of people for whom that, that, that kind of marketing of who we are isn't appropriate and they will never accept it. And so we need to somehow find a way to reach out to them. And anyway, I, I'd love at some point, Nicole and Neva, Neva to toss this over to you and well, that, get you to, because I know you react on that. This is Nicole. Um, Mark, that is our next topic after the census. And Neva, I would like you to start out on this, but can you talk about representation in multiple policy arenas? And um, I want to tell everyone else this because it was eye opening to me because I'm in the profession, but I'm mostly pre K to 12. And I was referring to as seniors, and Neva said, well, the correct term is older people. So I learned something just the other day that I did not know. So I'm very interested to hear your work and what how you feel about representation among older people. <laughs> well, many of us have heard about the silver tsunami. 10,000 people turning 65 every day, every day of the year, 365, yes. And it's gonna go on for another couple decades or so. Among those people who turn 65 every day, 1,500 of those people have an age-related vision loss that is permanent and not correctable. And when you start multiplying those numbers out, I can't do math. If I could do math, I would have been an engineer, but it's astronomical. So the first thing I'd like to change is the perception that people who are older and losing vision later in life are a low incidence population. They are mm -hmm. not, mm -hmm. they are not. Children may be, I really kind of question that to be honest, but I don't have the data to back that up. So I'll let the K through 12 folks argue that one, but older people who are losing vision and struggling with everyday activities like reading their prescription bottles and driving and uh, paying their own bills, that type of thing, is not a low incidence population. It is a, a, a huge ep epidemic. The other thing is, is that, um, Frameworks, an organization out of Canada, a nonprofit, has reframed how uh, people consider um, people over 55, 65, instead of seniors or elders or um, older adults or older people. They did this nationally demographic study. It's fascinating and you should visit their website. And they're basically reframing the way we talk about things. And AFB is undertaking a, a, a push to get blindness and low vision reframed so that we start using words that the population can identify with in a positive way. So what they did for aging is they took all of these um, adjectives for being older and put them down and had people say what adjectives, what, what words they associated. So like with elders, you might associate frailty. Um, you might associate wisdom, depending on your cultural background. And they did a nationally demographic representative study. And guess what? Older adults is the most positive, got the most positive um, adjectives associated with it. But when they ask the second question, and what age do you think of when you think of older adults? The age was 45 to 60. <laughs> I bet some of you out there who are 45 don't appreciate that very much because I know when I was 45, I did not consider myself an older adult. Now that I'm 64, 
I fall into the age group that these same people associated with older people, which is the plural, or older person, which is the individual, and I can't identify with that because I am getting older. I, I can't do the things I used to do. Uh, getting down on the floor, I don't know about y'all, but they put the floor a lot farther down these days and getting down and getting <laughs> back up is not pretty. You don't want to see it. So we have to start talking about people in a way that, that brings about a positive perception and that identifies people appropriately in the world of blindness and visual impairment. And AFB would love to partner with your organizations on this effort. It's not cheap. Uh, doing a nationally demographically representative study, sorry, Peggy, I butchered that, or Penny, I butchered that. I, I don't do research. It's not cheap. And so we're, we're working on a, on a funding campaign to be able to do that because we need those words in our world. We need to be able to talk about blindness and visual impairment in a positive way that society doesn't go, oh my God, if I lost my vision, I just have to kill myself. And we know because of studies that people fear blindness more than they fear anything, more than they fear cancer, more than they fear AIDS, more than they fear anything. And so we have to change that perception. Is that a big, huge awareness campaign? Absolutely it is. People who have vision loss don't know that there's help available, don't know that it's livable, don't know they can still do things, and they give up on life. And we have to stop that. Parents do the same thing for their kids when they find out their baby has a visual impairment. They give up on those dreams they had when they were pregnant with that child. And they don't have to. They may have to do those dreams a little differently. They may have to change those dreams a little bit, but they don't have to give up on their dreams. I sure haven't given up on my dreams, and I know an awful lot of people who are visually impaired or blind who didn't as well. Thank you, Neva. And it kind of leads in when we're talking about representing people and representing the field of blindness correctly, because we know that we're underrepresented. Can some, one of you start to answer on how can we work together to recruit and better prepare professionals in the field of blindness? Um, because we know we don't have enough professionals and we are always on the need list um, nationally. So how can we work together to improve that? Someone want to start by answering that? Can I appreciate the audit, auditory prompt? <laughs> um, I do. I think that we start working, we, we look around, first of all, you look within and you say, what am I most passionate about? You know, you've heard my story about Melody. I could very much see her getting on that bus in the morning and wondering why she was going to on a different route than I was. That was one of the first things. Why is she different than me? Why does the system see her differently? But you can look around, you've heard from Dr. McAllister, you've heard from others that are, that are getting their hands in the mud, right? We're getting our hands in the mud to say, can we work on standards that will help us better prepare people? You heard Dr. Rosenblum speak out about volunteers who want to look at data. You've heard Neva speak about older adults and this silver tsunami, people are passionate about different things. One of my students shared with me just, just recently in our online class that he loves this podcast called 99% um, Invisible. So for those of you that are out there and in, interested in podcasts, he loves this 99% Invisible, which is a, a, a chronicle really from an adult who is blind that's that constantly feels like they are having to represent themselves, that they are systemically invisible. Um, and, and Neva's right, we aren't a low incidence population. So I would say, find something within yourself that you are passionate about. Reach out to your professional organizations. This sounds like a membership drive from NPR, but become a <laughs> member of one of our organizations or both of our organizations and you can find a way in. And through that work, you will learn. You will learn more 
by contributing your own voice and your own passion, whether it's on standards. And Nicole had asked me to mention this before, so I, I will just mention that on the deafblind standards that we're renewing, these are for teachers of the deafblind and for interveners who work to support students who are deafblind in having access in school systems and in the community. We have had over 50 people involved in just renewing those standards. And it seems like really granular work. But you know, every time that those members got together on a Zoom call and looked at the literature and thought about how to write those standards, that represents, that, that echoes, right? Their work echoes because those standards then become something that represents the CEC. And administrators do look to that and they say, what the heck is an intervener? Why does this child need this? This is, no, this is real. There are standards around it. There is research base behind it. This organization called the CEC respects it. And so, yes, when we say this child needs this to have access to communication in the environment, it's, it has backing. And it came from the sweat of some people taking their time as volunteers to look through the literature, to wordsmith and to painstakingly dot every I and cross every T and, and braille every item so that they could, so that this could be something that we could hold our heads up and say, yes, this is, this is real. This is what represents what children need. So I think that's, that's the message is to look within, to reach out, and to get connected and to become involved in some of these activities because it does take all of us. Great, thank you. Anyone else on recruiting and preparing? I'm, I'm loving to weigh in, but I'm winking at Neva to see if she wants to go first. Oh, you have to wink louder, Mark. I didn't see that. <laughs> That's right. Um, well, John McAllister said it beautifully. We have to reach out to um, people of color, people who are not white females with access to the internet, <laughs> to get them interested in doing what we do. Because we know from research that people respond best to others who look like them and who they can identify with. And so if every child in America is being taught by a white female, uh, their braille, there's some of those kids who are just aren't gonna respond because they just don't connect. And recruiting is, is really our biggest need uh, in our field, I believe, um, because none of us are getting younger every day that goes by. Um, so we have to get out there and we have to look in places we haven't looked before. And we have to look for people who want to give back. You're not, you're not gonna be successful in this field if you're not a person who, who wants to give back to the world. They wanna help the world be a better place tomorrow than it was yesterday. And looking for those people who can have the passion to make a difference. We have, we have a responsibility as humans to make a difference. I love the fact that I've spent the 30 years that I've been a working professional giving back to people who are blind or visually impaired. And I know there are others out there who would like to do the same. And uh, so AER has a, has a, Personnel Preparation, no, that's not it. Professional Personnel Recruitment Committee, thank you, that's it, um, of people who care about recruiting people to the world of blindness and visual impairment, support, instruction, and teaching. And so if that's your passion, if you have something to say about that, then um, please reach out and get involved with that committee. So this, Mark, we've mentioned a couple of times about things that we can specifically do now. Let me put a couple of things on the table. So some of us have been talking about this for a while, and uh, it's frankly time that we stop talking about it and do it. Uh, the, there, there's something called the Historically Black Colleges and Universities, or HBCUs, 
There are examples of these institutions in our field. I, I, the first among equals I can think of off the top of my head is North Carolina Central University. Colleagues like Dr. Uh, William Weiner working there. Um, oh, as soon as I start dropping names, again, I'll frustrate somebody who I didn't mention, but uh, you get the picture. I think that there is a profound missed opportunity, money being left on the table, if you will, if we are not specifically as a field coming together to find strategies in which we can say to this array of institutions, and that's not the only one. I mean, I'm sure I, I need other people like our own president-elect, Dr. Laya Lenda Villar, to talk to, to me, certainly, about the Latin X world and how we might, there, there may be other bridges to build there. Fill in the blank, whatever you're connected with is what we're talking about here, okay? I'm just focused on the HBCUs for just for example, example purposes. If we don't have a field-wide strategy to say, here's a structure of universities that are on the front line preparing people, generally speaking, who frankly look a heck of a lot more like the profession, uh, like the people that all of us are serving right now, uh, then we're not doing our jobs. And, and by our jobs, I don't necessarily mean you or I individually, but as a field and certainly as a collective of organizations, we can and should in my humble opinion, uh, be reaching out to that network and others like it to say, look, uh, you, uh, let's work together to put together programs that prepare the next generation of folk serving kids, adults, and older folk. And, uh, and uh, by the way, you are exactly the population, you are precisely the network of folks with whom we ought to be working so that we are doing exactly maybe what you described, which is to have the uh, trainer, if you will, that professional meet the specific needs of the person who's on the other side of that table or standing side by side with them. So that's one practical thing. The other thing I would say is, you know, um, a number of, I used to work at AFB, Neva's working at AFB, Penny is working at AFB. We've all kind of invoked AFB, so I'm gonna invoke AFB too. Why the heck not? Uh, Carl Augusto had what I thought was a remark, our former uh, CEO, president CEO and current friend, um, that had uh, one of his many um, poignant moments when he got up at a meeting representing folks from the wider blindness community, uh, especially fellow CEOs, particularly some folks from the dog guide schools. And a few of those dog guide schools, I love them, never had a dog guide, but I'm going to, I'm going to point, I'm winking at you guys now. Uh, one of the folks from one of the dog guide schools got up and said, yeah, we're really having kind of a struggle to meet our programmatic needs. And Carl got up and said, you know, honestly, um, I have a lot of respect for you, but I'm not entirely sure that I can sit and listen to somebody talk about having programmatic needs when you have $200 million or more in the bank. So I would have a challenge for all of us that I think if we want to be change agents, one of the things that we ought to be expecting is how we can mobilize all of us to be those behind the scenes, nudging, whispering, whatever we have to do, to make sure that those people who do have the resources and the agencies that do still uh, shepherd their resources well and are good stewards, make a priority of those things uh, like we're talking about today, like focusing on account and focusing on personnel prep. I don't know why in the world, uh, look, I mean, COVID's a crazy time. All nonprofits have suffered. Lord knows I know that firsthand. Um, but there is no reason in the world why with even the limited resources that our community has some of us are doing better than others and if we if we uh believe as a community that personnel preparation and helping to support that next generation is a priority then by gosh by jingo we ought to be talking about those organizations that have resources to start establishing and endowing chairs to support the programs that we have and frankly to be advocating with departments of education the department of labor etc cetera, etc cetera, to really push the envelope. I frankly don't think we've done nearly enough. This is a perennial issue. Maybe it always will be, I hope not, but I know that there are strategies that can actually advance this if we're actually willing to do that hard work. Okay, thank you, Mark. So it's 12.19, so we only have 11 more minutes. So I'm gonna ask a question if each of you can answer in one to two minutes, so we can leave five for questions. Um, what do you feel is the greatest issue in the field and how or can we work together to solve it or are we working together to solve it? And I know that's a big question, but it's short time to answer. <laughs> well, this is Amy. I'll, I'll just jump in very quickly. I, I will say that I think that, that the counts 
plural, are one of the most pressing issues because it drives everything else in terms of preparation. But I do want to just add something else. I think that we have we have sorely lacked in providing information and in being inclusive and in recruiting people of color to our field. I think that we have not acknowledged that our children of color um, probably have received less services. I think that there is some data from our large data sets that, that point to the, that reality. We know that um, people of color are less likely to receive orientation and mobility services. And at the same time, there's a lot more work that we have to do. So I did want to point to one other opportunity. N Nicole mentioned it earlier with CEC's pre-conference and with the good hands of the people on this call, AER and many other co-sponsors of that, that pre-conference. We are hosting um, Monique Coleman, who will be speaking about culturally responsive practices as a TBI. Uh, Monique is also getting her doctorate. We're very excited to talk with her about that. We also know that uh, pedestrians of color are more likely to be hit by a car, that drivers yield less for persons of color. So I think that we as a field really, it, it's part of that representation when we talk about a census and having good numbers. It also means having a census that is reflective of this very diverse population. So I appreciate what Neva said that it's very nuanced. Dr. Rebecca Sheffield in the chat pod also mentioned it's also about having those good definitions. So I think pairing what Rebecca said with what Neva said about the language of, of what's acceptable, how people can identify as having a visual impairment um, or having deaf blindness, having dual sensory loss, those are, those are the most pressing issues of our time, and that includes people of color. Thank you. Neva or Mark? I guess I would like to just reiterate what I said about recruitment being what I think is our biggest need right now, and that's recruitment of a diverse population to our field of men and women. I don't know if you've ever looked around at one of these big gatherings, but the guys are pretty far and few between. <laughs> and um, so it's, it's, not, it's not just race or ethnic background or national origin or any of that. It's, it's also gender and it's, it's also age. Um, if you also look around in the big gatherings, if we ever get to do that again, you'll notice that a lot of people have gray hair. And although I don't plan to retire until they put me in a coffin or my brain stops working, I don't think that everybody is going to do that. And so we've got to get to the younger people who are looking for careers. I didn't come to this career until I was in my 30s because I took time off to have a family and raise my children. But not everybody has that luxury. So we need to catch the 22 year olds, not only to teach, um, but to work with older people and to uh, train adults to uh, work in a career that they can love. And I'm gonna paraphrase a Rebecca Sheffield quote that I got off of an AFB blog that she so kindly shared with me and Mark and others. Uh, recently, but I added some things to it. In order to grow, be recognized, organized, and empowered as a field, we must invite, encourage, and support one another in our field. And we must participate in AER and DVIDB. I finally learned it, Nicole. I've got it. I promise where we can develop, discuss, and uphold standards for our various professions. Thank you for inviting me to be on this panel. Well, uh, there's really nothing more to add to that, but of course I will. Um, and that's to encourage all of you to, um, I, I, I'm not gonna do this, but 
if I could, if I could find a way to do it with my camera, I'd get down on my knees uh, and, and ask you pleadingly, uh, when you hear from Nicole, when you hear from those of us at AER, our colleagues at AFB, I really frankly at this point don't necessarily care where you, where you get it. All those sources of information and many more are, 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 are good, solid, reliable sources of information. Obviously, if you're an AER person, by golly, I hope you respond to an AER message. But when you get something that says, we need you to drop a little note, send a little email, do a, do a please help us respond. And some of you are saying, oh, good grief, we're going to hear this sermon again. All I want to make sure that you understand is that, yes, one or two or three or four people, 400 would be amazing, uh, 4,000 would be fantabulous, to use the technical legal term. The reality of it is, yes, a handful of people can make a difference. The handful of people that responded years ago, when a number of us were working on the accessible textbook legislation, that's what turned it around. Not 400 or 4,000 contacts, but one parent who showed up at one meeting and cracked this, you know, ice, cold as ice heart of a member of uh, the staff on Capitol Hill. That's what made the difference. Years ago, I remember what a former colleague at AFB saying, my gosh, the US Department of Education is really trying to rip the rug out from underneath uh, our university programs because of a policy that they were trying to implement. We had 42, 42, not 420, but 42 responses when we asked for people to weigh in. Some of us thought, God, that, that's kind of disappointing. Gee whiz, if it's really bad. Why am you? You know what the Department of Education did? They called up my colleague, our former colleague at AFB and said, call the dogs off. We get it. We're not going to do this policy change. So my, my personal appeal to you is, yes, you can make a difference. Everyone who's involved in AER or DVI-DB, but frankly, anyone listening to this presentation, when you see an appeal, we're not just trying to, you know, puff ourselves up or send out an email. It really does make a difference. And yes, a handful can really, really change the world. You have already. So, so keep it up and let's do more of it. If the biggest problem I would identify would be a sense of, of uh, cynicism or apathy that sometimes is very tempting to buy into. That it doesn't matter. I've heard all of this before. Don't tell me that this particular issue is so important or my God, it's really serious this time. It's always serious. And you're always in charge. You can do it. You have done it. So that's my personal appeal for the day. That's what I think is our biggest challenge. Thank you. So we only have about three more minutes. Um, and Amy, do you want to just say about the picture you shared on the screen? Well, yeah, just for full access, I did share an image of Melody using her iPad to make a phone call to me. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is also to thank Mark and others who helped pass the 21st Century Communication and Video Accessibility Act of 2010. This is just one example of a cross disability, a cross sensory disability advocacy effort that led to an equipment distribution program. Melody, who is still alive and well and doing very well in her own home in Tennessee, which is supported by a Medicaid waiver, she did get an iPad and she is able to make phone calls. And other people who are deaf blind have received equipment that helps them stay connected in a pandemic. So this is, I, I share this picture of her because one, I have permission to do so, she has allowed me to. But two, it connects the dots for me in a very personal way that these efforts around policy, these efforts around standards, these efforts around research do touch people's lives. Thank, Thank you so much. I know. Amy, that's great. I know I didn't pay you to do that, but the check's in the mail, my friend. Thank you. Um, I know that Leanne has to share the closing codes, but we can't really get to all the questions. But yes, we do need to discuss not only people of color, but also include Hispanic and Asian populations, really all diverse populations. And a comment was that men are really underrepresented as well. And that is also true. It is a woman and do woman dominant field. But I think talking about it and having the conversations going are go is going to help and change over time. And AR, DVI, and both 
we are going to work together and, you know, continue working together to make our feel better or make our field better. Um, so we're on our last minute. Um, thank you and reach out to any of us with questions and I'm going to turn it over to Leanne. Okay, well, I want to say thanks all of you for a wonderful pre meeting a great way to start off our APH better together and talking about how we are better together. Those of you that have joined us this entire time, you are listening for a closing code, which is the word terraining. The closing <laughs> code is terraining. Both places offer quite a bit of it. So that is your closing code. There is a link both in the chat, but it's also in your crowd compass so that you have the ability to, to submit that. You submit those individually, meaning you'll submit for this session. And then if you attend a session this afternoon, you submit that one. So that is available to you. And then please don't forget to complete your feedback, your survey feedback, which is also inside the Crowd Compass app. That really is helpful for us to know what worked, what didn't, and then I will be sharing that wonderful document with all of these wonderful people who just spoke to you. If you are getting ready for your next session, know that you have a half hour break, which means I get to eat my lunch. So it is time for all of you to disappear. Um, one more quick question, if people are still sticking around that I just wanted to ask Nicole and Mark, if you know that did come in, and I know it's a quick answer, maybe. What are, what's the membership number for each entity? What's the membership number for DVID? What's the membership um, number for AER? DVIDB is right around 385. Thank God that during these COVID days, we were expecting a big drop off, quite frankly, and we've not, folks have stuck with us right now. The number's hovering about 3,200 and growing. Okay. Well, I, I just want, want to, to say thank you, you. Leanne. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, guys. Thank you, Leanne. Woohoo! <laughs> um, I don't know if Penny, Nicole, and John would be willing to turn on their camera for a quick minute. I would love to catch a picture. I'll give it a minute and I'll let you know when I do it. I'm working on getting John and Penny. Now, can they have and, dogs or cats in the picture or out of the picture? <laughs> I'm just, I'm going to wait for them. And I want to say thank you to my captionist very yes. much. And we look forward to possibly seeing you as our captionist again. You never know. Okay. John, if you're there, I'd love to I'm, catch you. I'm picture. trying, Leanne. That's okay. Okay. That's okay. I wasn't sure if you had disappeared No, I'm, I'm here. I'm just, um, oh, there we go. this video camera thinking my life would be better. Yep. Uh, okay, you're yeah. good. And Penny, when you're ready, you can sit up and we got you. Ready? One, Am two, I sitting? Okay. you're sitting. <laughs> One, <laughs> two, three. All right. Thank you guys so very, very much. Oh, this, Love was, this was really that. great. Thank you for the invitation. And um, I hope that right. this works some interest in folks and they'll come tomorrow to learn more. Yep. So thank you all for great. If thank those you, of you are joining me later, I will be popping on after I get my lunch and I will have that open once I get And I just want to say Nicole Johnson rocks. Let's do this again. Maybe not tomorrow, <laughs> but, but let's definitely do this again for sure. Yeah, thank you everyone. <laughs>